Well, it is great to be back, and we are here to talk about some really important stuff, numbers that people who are trying to learn how to be a do-it-yourself investor really, I think, need to know. And it was interesting, this morning, my wife and I were having one of our discussions where we each had our pad of paper out. And I was writing on the dining room table while she was worried I was going to end up doing something to the dining room table. So she handed me a copy of the Atlantic Monthly to put under what I was writing on. I felt like a child, but I did what she said to do. And I looked at the title of this magazine that that, that, that they were focused on, we're already living in the metaverse. And then when you drop down, there are three kind of headlines. Reality is blurred, boredom is intolerable, and everything is entertainment. And I thought about those three things as it pertains to the reason that we are here, the reason we spend time when we're not here working on something we're going to present in the future to try to help. Because the reality is, we really would like to be the have the process of investing be boring. We actually believe that boring is beautiful when it comes to that investment process. And we also believe that we are not in the entertainment business here. We are not trying to sell ads. We are not trying to do anything but give you good, solid, evidence-based kinds of investing information. And this presentation today is truly one of the most important that we will make. We just went through a couple of them where first we focused on what equity asset classes should be in a portfolio, or you can pick some from this group. And those are not the equity asset classes we have chosen. Those all came out of the academic industry. Then we went into, okay, there's this list of 10 different equity asset classes. Do we have to own them all? And Chris has worked diligently to put together combinations of smaller groups of the 10 to come up with what looks like almost the same level of volatility, almost the same long-term extra return that comes from the ultimate buy and hold portfolio compared to the S&P 500. But now we have to move on to uh, what I think is a very important step, and that is to determine when it is time to add fixed income to the portfolio because you want to reduce the volatility, you want to stabilize, you're getting close to retirement, let's say, and you can't take another 50% decline in the market. What are you going to do? Well, you could become a market timer, but we don't know that that works for very many people. The other choice is to match the appropriate amount of equity with the appropriate amount of fixed income. And these fine-tuning tables, it must be 25 years now since we've been building these tables so that people had information that they could look at and they could learn from. And of course, we all have this huge advantage, and that is we have Daryl Balls on our team. And Daryl Balls is the one who has put together not only the ultimate uh, buy and hold table, but also the fine tuning tables. And later in coming up, we'll have the distribution tables and we'll have the accumulation tables. But Daryl, do us a favor. Introduce us, if you will, to the layout of that table and how you put those numbers together so that that we can go in and start figuring out what lessons are there. Sure. So let me share the screen here. You guys see it? Yep. Okay. So this is an example of a fine-tuning table. This one happens to be the S&P 500 equity table. And it's ordered by year. 
and buy returns from the equity portfolio and the bonds portfolio, 100% bonds, 100% fixed income, and 100% equity, in this case, 100% S&P 500. And then in between those, you see these 10, 90, 20, 80, 70, 30. Those represent the percentage of equity and percentage of fixed income as you add more equity. You go from 10% equity to 20% equity to 30% equity. And then below that, in those columns, are the returns of the portfolios that would have, uh, what the portfolio return would have been for those years. And we we do this for the returns since 1970 through the end of last year in this particular table. And then down at the bottom, we summarize some statistics <clears throat> or some, some numbers for you. We show the annualized compound rate of return across this column here, and then the standard deviation, annualized standard deviation for those returns. As you add more equity, it gets more and more volatile. As you add more equity, it gets a higher and higher compound rate of return. And then in the next box down, there's a set of, you might think of them as either risk uh, considerations or volatility considerations, but they're, they're the worst six months out of, out of these past 53 years. We use monthly returns. So this is the worst six months of a return from in the bond market, it was minus 7.6%. In the 100% S&P 500, it was down almost 42%. So over, over a six month period in the last 53 years, the S&P 500 returned minus almost 42%. The 12, 12, uh, worst 12 months, uh, it's, it's, is, is done the same way across here with the different uh, equity allocations. So got down to minus 43% in one case. As you look longer, the worst three years, this is an annualized rate of return or annualized drawdown, rather. It, the, the drawdowns get less. They get less worse. Uh, they get better. Uh, and that's because as you look longer and longer in, in time, uh, historically, these are all historical numbers. Historically, the, the equity losses have, and even the bond losses have, have uh, gone away. And then here's the worst five years. So there was one point in time where over five years, the S&P 500 returned a minus 7%, almost minus 7% per year. And at one point over the last 53 years, it was down 51%. Um, so as we mentioned, these worst drawdowns are, are for each one of these individualized asset allocations, whether you have 10% equity or 90% equity or 100% equity. But one of the things that, that happened last year that was interesting, and it doesn't happen very often when I'm building these tables, is that we had an event that caused some of these worst drawdown numbers to change. They don't normally change. If you go back and you look at the history of the tables, they don't normally change from one year to, to the next, at least to the level that we've seen happen here. And I'll show you what, what this looked like last year. But last year, bonds lost almost 10%, our bond portfolio, 50% intermediate, 30% short-term, 20% tips, lost, almost 10%. And that ended up causing a new worst drawdown number of 11.4%. So if we go back and we look at what it was last year, this is for last year's set of tables, it was minus 6%. So it's almost double what the worst drawdown was before. Last year, we suffered a drawdown in the bond market that was almost double of what the worst drawdown we'd had in the previous 52 years at that point. So that's something to keep an eye on when you're looking at these tables is, is to look at the differences if you, from one year to the next if, if, you, uh, if you're interested in seeing how that works. And to me, what that shows is that the drawdown numbers, for example, these last year drawdown numbers that were here, they represent a worst, 
a, a best worst case, if you will. Um, they're, they're a lower bound on how bad things could get. And uh, as Chris has said before, the longer your history, the worst worst case you're going to have. You're going to get a worst worst case the longer back you look. So that happened last year. So you know, that, one, of, one of the things uh, also is that this this is the S and P 500 equity portfolio. We we have nine sound investing portfolios, and I think Paul has talked about those in the past. And we use all the different asset classes. So if you're interested in what those are and the funds we use to do that, there is a file on the website that talks about the the, the funds and or indexes in some cases that we use to generate these, these table tabular returns for the different portfolios. That's that's great, Daryl. And uh, I I, I want to follow up a little bit on on what you said about those bonds. Uh, it was a terrible year for bonds, and one of the things that made it better for the people that follow our work is that we have not for people who want to stabilize their equity portion, their equity part of the portfolio against high volatility we only recommend short to intermediate term bonds. And so that 9.9% loss that happened for the calendar year, if we had been in long-term treasuries instead of short to intermediate, it would have been a loss from 25 to 30%. So, so this, is exact, this is a great example of why we don't go long on bonds. And, and, and by the way, those long bonds uh, on average do not make a better rate of return than the intermediate term bonds. So we want you to be where the return is, is good, uh, but the risk is the lowest that we can get to uh, and get that decent return that, that longer term bonds can get. So I, I, I just want to note that. I also want to note something here because I really want you to be comfortable with these tables. I want you to look at 2008 and look at the uh, the the 50 50 strategy uh, in stocks and bonds, and uh, you'll see there there was a loss of 16.7 percent. Now, one of the things that we have tried our best to do is to suggest to people: please look at the past and get a sense of not only how good things can be because there were some amazingly good years for bonds because interest rates were very high uh, back in the 90s and back in the 80s. But this was a terrible year because the stock market was down 37%. It wasn't because the bond market was down. It was because the stock market was down. Bonds were actually up 8.3%. You put that together with the loss of the 37%, and you end up with a negative 16.7. It is interesting to note that the 50-50 strategy in 2022 only lost, I say only lost, 13.8%. And, and, and so uh, that actually was a better year than what we had known as the worst year uh, it, it, uh, before. So if you go back up to the top, Daryl, let me just suggest that people might get a good sense of this table. If they just note 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, just look at the difference between the stocks and the bonds. Be prepared. There are going to be periods like 1970 where the bond market is up strong and equities are not. And then you're going to have like 1980 where the stock market's up 30 plus and the bonds are up seven. Then you're going to have a year like 1990 where the stock market is up 9.7 and the bond uh, the, and the equities are down 3.1. And then 2000, the uh, the S&P 500 was down 9.1, and bonds uh, were up 11.3. I mean, just, just to get a sense 
of how different these returns are going to be. And, 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 and certainly, we, nobody has any idea when the really bad times are going to come and when the really good times are going to come. But they're all on this page. Now, when I say all on this page, there are plenty of good times. There are plenty of bad times represented here. But this is what the long-term investor needs to understand they're likely to go through. And I don't care what column you take. I happen to mention the 50-50. That's what my wife and I have. We have said, because we're 50-50, that we are willing to have a one-year loss of 20 to 25 percent. Well, it didn't come in 2008. I mean, that's the good news. But we are ready for more loss than is represented there. But if you went all the way to the bottom of this page, what you would see is that there was a 12-month period. Remember, Daryl said that these are based on starting a new period every month. So there was a 12-month period that, in fact, uh, we would have lost 23.2% with a 50-50 strategy. So that's why we developed these pages, to give people a sense of what the drive would feel like. We know that one of the challenges for investors uh, is that they haven't faced a lot of conditions before. And I don't care what it is that we're doing. Uh, something where you could make a mistake and it could cost you. Like when you first started driving, think about that, how anxious you were. Because all of a sudden, all the things that were moving around you became a potential problem. You might hit them if you're not careful. I can re recall when I drove across the Aurora Bridge for the first time. I think I was 18 or 19 years old. And I got to tell you, I was filled with anxiety because my mind was saying, Paul, if you're not careful, you might go down into the sound there. So, so that's true with investing, I think. Uh, you, you have to experience some of these things. Uh, in order to become comfortable with the reality that, and find out how it feels not only to go through the bad times, but to come back out and be do well in the good times. So that is uh, the, the kind of the overview of what I feel that you're looking at. Plus, and you've already touched on it, Daryl, but it is so important, little decisions you're going to make are going to mean potentially millions of dollars. And you'll see that when we get into the accumulation uh, tables and into the distribution tables. And one of those decisions you make is how much in equity and how much in fixed income. And just note, as we look at the annualized returns from all bonds to, 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 to uh, all equity, notice it goes from 6.7 in all bonds to 7.2 because you added 10% equity. Now you also took on a very little bit of extra risk, but I assure you, when you look at a lifetime in, of investing and you can pick up an extra one half a percent and not do something that's gonna, that's gonna push you over the edge of having the sense of comfort, that is a big deal. And when you add another 10%, it is from 7.2 to 7.7, .7, another half a percent. And as you go across that table, as Daryl noted, every column, the return gets higher. And in almost every column, the losses get greater. But I want you to understand that that is not the relationship between stocks and bonds one year at a time, because one year at a time, even over five years, you may find you are not getting a higher return, you are getting a lower return, because these returns we're talking about are over the long term. And, and, and we're doing our best to give you a sense of what that pain may be for the gain that you might make. Now, if we just look uh, for a second 
uh, Daryl, let's let's go back to, uh, but let's move on to the ultimate buy and hold strategy. Let's do that. And 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 the ultimate buy and hold strategy is you, let's let's just look at the bottom line number of how much you would have made if you scattered your investments over ten different equity asset classes, ten percent in each one, not sticking your neck out in any one of those asset classes, but instead of a 10.4% compound rate of return, it's 11.8. Now that is, again, if I'm looking for an extra half of 1%, going from 10.4 to an 11.8, you're getting about three of them. And that's a big deal. But then we have to look at the risk and say, does it make sense? And when you look at the risk, if you looked at the worst drawdown, the worst drawdown was 58% versus 51% for the S&P 500. So yes, you had to accept a little more pain. It might not have felt like a little more pain. It may have felt like the straw that was about to break the, the camel's back and that you've had enough and you're getting out and you're going to put your money somewhere safe. But, you know, if you know that's going to happen, maybe you ought to have this combination of equity asset classes in com with, with, with the uh, uh, some fixed income, some bonds, because there you can get very, very close kinds of, uh, of risk and better returns using the ultimate buy and hold strategy. Now, this is the, this is the table that I sh I've been showing for uh, decades. And when I say not through 2022, obviously, but this fine tuning table was it along with the S&P 500. And I was trying to convince people to broaden their diversification and show them these two tables. And then Chris Pedersen came into the life of our foundation and, uh, and, and helped us put together some portfolios that don't take 10 different equity asset classes plus three bond funds to go along with it. And I really would love uh, to have Chris discuss some of those um, uh, easier portfolios uh, uh, to manage and, and be able to take a look at what happened to your risk what happened to your return when you went to a smaller group of mutual funds? So, Chris, if you'd be kind enough to uh, uh, take a look at the worldwide four fund portfolio, I'll, I'll I'll do that. But let's stick on this page just for a minute. I want to sure. I want to finish a point that you were making. Uh, you said you used these charts when you were trying to encourage investors to diversify more broadly. And I think you, you got close to the close of why that's a slam dunk argument, but I just wanted to finish it off. If you remember back to the S&P 500, if you were 100% equities, you got a 10.4% Kager with a 51% worst case drawdown. He calls, uh, Daryl notes those as negative, so negative 51%. So let's say I want the same Kager. I want to have the same compound annual growth rate of 10.4% or better. Well, I look across the chart and it looks to me like it's the 90, 80, 70% equity, right? 70% equity. I historically would have had a 10.6% return, but look at the worst drawdown, minus 42.9%. Yeah. So there is a way using the ultimate buy and hold, at least historically, to have gotten a a better or comparable return with less risk. And, and I think that's probably what you did with an investor is you said, if you want to be 100% S&P 500, you can, but why would you? Why would you take more risk to get the same return when we can create a portfolio that's got a better chance of performing giving you the same kind of return with less risk. And I can't imagine an investor sitting across the table not being compelled by that. That just seems like a really strong argument. That's great, Chris. I think I said that a couple of times. <laughs> I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great point to make. 
All right. Well, the floor is yours. Go on and uh, sure. Let's let's take a look at the uh, worldwide uh, four fund. So uh, what we did is we tried to figure out a way with less funds to duplicate this portfolio's characteristics. And what are those characteristics? The characteristics are that it's half in the U.S., half outside the U.S. It's half in large cap. It's half in small cap. It's half in blend and it's half in value. So with four funds, is that possible? Well, what we do in the worldwide four fund is we US, use U.S. large cap blend and U.S. small cap value combined with international large cap value and international small cap blend. And that should give us those characteristics. And with those characteristics, you would think you've got a good chance of having a similar kind of return. Now, if we remember back to the ultimate buy and hold, it had in a 100% equity portfolio, a compound annual growth rate of 11.8% and a worst case drawdown of minus 58%. So what do we have here? 11.9%, pretty close to 11.8 and minus 57% instead of minus 58 I would say those differences are within the uncertainty of the process. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we don't really know what the future is going to be, but looking back at the past, these four funds gave us a very similar exposure to the important things that drove the returns. It doesn't have REITs. It doesn't have emerging markets. There are some corners that we cut that make it a little bit different. And if that's going to bother you as an investor, if you're going to sleep better at night knowing that you have a more diversified portfolio with those additional funds, then you should probably use the ultimate buy and hold. But if you're okay with this evidence telling you that you'll get a similar return and you don't want the complexity, I think most people will do just fine with the worldwide uh, four fund. And uh, if we looked at that other data point, uh, just going back to the uh, 90, 80, 70%, at 70% equities here, you had a 10.6% return, very similar to the S&P 500 and minus 42% for the worst case drawdown, which again is much better than you would have gotten with the S&P 500. I think the standard deviation is also less too. Oh, yeah. Although yes, the standard deviation is is definitely less. So, so the ride is a little smoother. You get the yep. same return and you get less or smaller, worse drawdown. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I we haven't been using his name recently, but I do want to give a shout out back to Trev H and the Bogleheads for being the first person to suggest this portfolio as a way to simply get at the same kind of returns that you get with the ultimate buy and hold. And uh, I think... I think it was clever. I, I think it uh, it will serve investors well, and I'm grateful for the work you did. Yep. That's so great. We can also – oh, go ahead, Paul. No, no, please. You're on a roll here. I, I thought you were about to go to the U.S. only. Yeah, I was going to say we can simplify further and just go to U.S. only. And you can imagine investors uh, in their own mind figuring out ways to combine these two and go in between as well. Uh, and they probably do, because a lot of times people are more or less comfortable with the international diversification. But uh, there is no real historical reason to believe that the U.S. or international is going to give us a greater return. There, you could We could debate it all day long. Um, it really is going to come down to all kinds of sociopolitical and regulatory things we can't predict in the future. Uh, but... Uh, some people are very comfortable with U.S. only. So we created this U.S. four fund portfolio that includes the large cap blend, small cap blend, large cap value, small cap value, 25% to each. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, Daryl's already got them highlighted. The CAGR, the compound annual growth rate, again, very similar, 12.0%. The worst drawdown, minus 56.7%, um, and that compares to the ultimate buy and hold at minus 58. So almost the same. And again, that 70-30 delivering better return than the S&P 500 with lower risk. So 
Another way to simplify that might fit your comfort zone more, some people believe there's enough diversification internationally just because U.S. businesses have a lot of their business internationally. Uh, The truth is, though, when you invest 100% in the U.S., you're exposed to U.S. idiosyncratic risk that you're not compensated for. So if, if the regulatory environment or political environment or uh, something else goes sideways in the U.S. in a way that jeopardizes the security of, of these equities uh, and these bonds, you've taken that risk on with no insurance policy. And that's why I invest internationally is that I, I look at it as a very low cost insurance policy. It's a way to uh, spread that risk out. And I'm not quite the nervous Nelly that Paul is. Uh, I tend to be a little bit more optimistic, perhaps more optimistic than I should be. But uh, I think that that tapping into that nervousness is a good thing when you're investing, trying to figure out all the things that could go sideways. And especially if you can diversify in a way that's not expected to lower your turns significantly, why not? Yeah. I think that's great, Chris. And and uh, just as a, a, a important point here, Daryl has also put uh, another nine tables, I'm sorry, not another, another uh, additional set of tables that have 70% U.S., 30% uh, international when it's a worldwide uh, portfolio. So those people who are uncomfortable with a 50-50 can go look at the risk situation uh, with the 70-30. And uh, Daryl, could you take us to... Uh, uh, two the, fund. Pardon? The two fund. Yeah, the two funds. Yeah. This is an additional simplification and still gets you the corners of the market. And it is. Well, it doesn't get you the corners, but it gets you half in large, half well, in small, half in value, half in, in blend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Those corners. But it's close. It gets you two of the four quarters. Yes. And and uh, for a lot of people, uh, it will be more sim- more simple to, to, to manage, and uh, and the returns are are, are very similar. So uh, that too, I think, is something that uh, folks might uh, might look at if you wanted to be an outlier. And we don't even have to spend any time on this because you'll have all of these tables available to you. Uh, uh, along with this uh, uh, this presentation, but uh, you you could be if you want to go to outside the the boxes, you could become all value, and all value doesn't that in fact historically uh, end up giving you a better return with a little more risk. And and uh, I can just remember one number, just looking at this table here, instead of 12.2, the uh, the all value portfolio, I think, was about 13. And instead of a 55.8% uh, decline in the drawdown, it was about 60. So there was more risk, and there was a commensurate additional return uh, to go with that. So here's the big question that, that an investor really should ask, and I'd love to hear your comments. And that is, Daryl, why don't you take it first? Because you put these together. What could go wrong? Well, as we saw in the last year, the things that used to be worst case are now not the worst case. That's that's what could go wrong. Um, other than other than that, well, the other thing that could go wrong is you could have a really good year too on the upside. Wrong being meaning different than than what things have, have happened in the past. So uh, the whole point of of these tables, one of the one of the points of these tables is to show a possible. A, it's a historical sequence of returns, an approximation of a historical sequence of returns to help show the difference between the asset classes and the difference between how difference between portfolios when you when you mix them together um is this what will happen in the future i can guarantee no 
Mm-hmm. Um, it just because the general randomness of the way these things happen. So the same 53 year sequence, it's maybe not never, but it's extremely unlikely that you'll see anything like this in your lifetime uh, or any other lifetimes for that matter, probably. The um, I think to, to think about these, to use these tables and think about them as what has happened in the past, and it represents a, a an approximation of, of what could happen in the future when you look at the differences between them. I don't know that I would say that, you know, okay, th- this particular portfolio, the two fund, that you'll get 12.2. Yeah, no. Will you get more than the S&P 500? Yeah, probably, probably. Um, so I, I think that's the way to look at these. Will you get 2% more or 1.8% more? that this shows? Probably not. Will it be enough more to make a significant difference? Yeah, maybe. But the other thing I think to think about when you look at these is that it's not so much that that these more diversified portfolios will will get you a will get you this higher return. The question is will will they get you a better return than a market portfolio? And I think it's I think it's I think it's a higher probability high prob higher probability that they'll get you a better return um, than that they won't. Uh, will it be the same return as we show? No, but it'll be more, most likely. Well, and that probability improves over time. If you uh, invest in a portfolio that has a higher expected return than the S and P five hundred. Uh, for a day, it's a coin flip, which one's going to outperform. If you invest for a year, uh, it starts to tilt more in your favor. Maybe it's, uh, you know, like 55, 45%. If you invest for a decade or 20 years, now it starts to become, you know, you're talking like 90%, 95% that you know, the probability is that the higher expected return shows up. Uh, so uh, it's patience, patience and sticking with it is what will get you there. And I think what else will get you there is the ability to be in the right funds for each of these asset classes. Because if you're in the right fund, and as you know, Chris Pedersen works on the best-in-class ETFs. That is exactly what he's trying to help you do. But that would be in funds or ETFs that have low expenses. It it it, it would be in a small-cap value uh, security a fund or ETF that the size is appropriate for what it is you're trying to get out of that asset class. There are some small cap value funds that are five to six billion dollars in average size, while others are two to three. So it is, uh, and oh, and by the way, the other thing that could go wrong is you could be in a 401k plan that does have a small cap value fund, but it's actively managed and it has high expenses. So there are a lot of things, and one more thing that could go wrong. There are long periods. Uh, we don't have it with us here today, but if you remember the uh, Daryl Ball's telltale chart comparing the, the small cap value to the S&P 500, there are 15 to 20 year periods that they basically make the same return. And then small cap value charges ahead only then to be less than the best for a while. It is, this is not about a single year. It's not about a single decade. And when you get to be my age, life is about a single decade. And that that's a challenge. And if, in my case, my wife's case, we think about investing for people who are gonna survive us, who are gonna be around for many decades. Therefore, we're willing to take the risk of being in small cap value and 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 the, all those other asset classes in the ultimate buy and hold strategy 
with the right amount of fixed income. For us, it's 50-50. So uh, there are a lot of things that won't go as you expect. But we believe that one of the keys to long-term success is to have a realistic expectation for what's likely to happen. And history gives us more lessons in this than anybody who's guessing what's going to happen next. Because history tells us nobody really knows. And uh, and I think that we have we overlooked anything, guys? I don't think I have anything. All right. Chris, Great. Chris you're I'm, I'm good. I think I think we covered it. Now I'll tell you what we're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna be getting questions from people about these tables. And uh, we're gonna gather those together in the uh, coming weeks as we go through this whole series. And uh, likely at the end of this series, we're gonna have some very serious Q and A sessions where we do answer your questions to make sure not only do you understand these tables, but so that if there's something that is uh, isn't making any sense, we we help you make sense of it as best we can. So we're here to help. Next time we get together, we're going to be talking about accumulation, and that means putting now these these. Uh, fine-tuning tables to work with money, with, with real money being invested starting in 1970. And that's going to be followed by taking money out in retirement. So we got a lot more important uh, presentations that are going to take you as, as, as deep as we can into this evidence-based uh, in, investing um, array of, of information to make you a better do-it-yourself investor. So my thanks to Daryl. My thanks to Chris. You guys are great. Thanks for all the wonderful work that you're doing. And we need your help. We need you to tell other people about our work. And so we hope you'll pass it on. And you can start, if you want, by forwarding either a free copy, a PDF of Chris's book, Two Funds for Life, or or Rich Buck and, and, and my book, uh, uh, the uh, we're talking millions. Uh, sorry, I don't have a copy of that here. I should, um, but those are available in a PDF format. And ah, Daryl's got a copy. Uh, golly, I wonder if he actually read it. <laughs> there it is. Of ah, course he did. Of course he did. Ways to supercharge your retirement. So we're willing to help. Uh, and uh, and we love it when we hear from you about how this work has been helpful. I, that is the compensation that we get because uh, none of us uh, are, are working for money here. We're working for you, and I hope you know that. Thanks for watching.